Good morning. Get things set up here for just a moment. How about that? Whoa! How about that? All righty. Hey, never goes the way you want to. I didn't fly, the technical things are getting to me, but we will get there. So, okay. So back to where we're at. Sorry for the folks online, I apologize. You just missed a few little bit. Basically, I was saying, what if I prayed really hard to fly? Prayed really, really hard all my life said, God, let me fly. Could I fly then? Well, if it's God's will, sure. We got confidence that he can do anything he wants to, right? If he wanted me to, I could fly. But here's a question. Should I fly? What benefit is there to me if I fly? Now, I think it is awesome. I think it'd be cool. You know, it seems like a, a really cool thing to do. What about the long-term benefits? Would flying help me get my soul back to God? I may think I can reach the sky and reach heaven, but is that how you get there? Would it help anyone else's soul find their way back to God? No, there's no requirement to fly or even to be cool to save my soul. So, 
Try one more technology thing to see if it'll do it for me. Here we go. All right. So far, so good. Does God want me to fly? What if I ask that question? Well, I didn't take off like Superman. Brother Ed probably thinks that's far from it. Thank, again, thank you, Brother Ed. <laughs> so it's a pretty sound thing that God didn't want me to fly. He didn't want me to take off. I'm not floating in the clouds. I'm not even hovering off the ground. If I'd asked that one question to start off with, though, would I have wasted my energy up here? Risk possible injury just then? No, I would have been smarter. Now, this simple scenario seems simple, even silly. Me up here jumping around. But let's apply this to our lives. How often do we push what we want over what God wants? It happens, doesn't it? When we pray, do we really have the strength and the courage to honestly say, your will be done? Because that's tough. That's hard when you get into it. Now, think about this. Before we get into that, how often in the Bible does God say, hey, guys, you're doing good. Netflix and chill. That's all I want from you. Doesn't happen, does it? The only time I can remember ever being told to be still is things like Psalm 46, when basically his servants are going through some severe turmoil, and God's saying, be still. Know that I'm God. I will get you. I will take care of you. Even in those times when we're to be still, it takes some strength, some effort, some courage to do it. So when we ask for God's will to be done, what are we really getting into? What are we talking about? So let's go back to the very beginning, Garden of Eden. What was God's will for Adam and Eve? Let's look Genesis 1 toward the bottom of it. Genesis 1, 27 to 28. And this is what God's plan for Adam and Eve was. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the earth. Two buck naked people with no brand new to things, no infrastructure, no tools, no YouTube videos, no books to learn from, no house, no vehicles, no swimming lessons. And their tasks were populating the earth and ruling over every living thing on it. Now, on one hand, God's first command to his people is basically be king and queen of it all. And that's cool. That's nice. But on the other hand, what a trip that must have been. They don't even have the clothes on their back and they're told to rule the whole earth. <laughs> that's a huge plan, right? But that's, that's the thing. God has incredible plans for us, doesn't he? He loves us, and he wants some things to come out from us. And those can be scary. They can be daunting. And those tasks can be out of We have no idea how it's going to play out. Or how we're going to accomplish them. How we're going to do them. But you know what? If those plans are big, that scary and daunting kind of goes with it, doesn't it? It's kind of part and parcel. Now, it would be great if those incredible plans were like the lottery. You know, just walking down the street, pay a dollar, get your ticket, take it home, and boom, I'm the jackpot. Yes, that would be awesome, right? I mean, think about that. If all those incredible plans said, mansion, all sorts of things going for you, I'm walking away from the market, and I'll not do that. But imagine if it was just that instant and that easy to have that happen for you, right? No work, no effort, just jackpot. Has that ever happened? Well, let's look in the Bible, because there's a time that actually came pretty close to this. Back in Exodus. If you would, 
Turn to Exodus 32. Now, this is really small on the screen, so you may want to turn to there in your Bible. I'll go ahead and forewarn you. Exodus 32, 1 through 9. In Exodus, when the Israelites left Israel, all they had to do was walk. Not all that far. God marked the path, and gave them water, gave them food, made sure the shoes didn't wear out, and gave them the miracle after miracle to remind them that he was there and he was taking care of them. All they had to do was walk, and everything was handed to them. Let's see what they did. Exodus 32, 1 through 9. And that's a little bit of a reading, so bear with me here. Exodus 32, beginning in verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses lay coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears. And brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then he said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar for it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. And then he rose early the next day, and offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And look what God does here. And the Lord said to Moses, get down, for your people have brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a motor calf and worshiped it and sacrificed to it. Instead, this is your God who is one brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Everything was handed to them. All they had to do was walk. Miracles were happening all over the place. They were so spoiled that in the few days that Moses is up on that mountain, they're like, ah, he's gone. He's dead. Let's build us a new one. Think about that. Humans do not do well with instant jackpots, do we? When it's too easy, that's not so good. Well, let's take this further. Let's go a little bit more. What if we don't want those plants? What if that's not how we want it to be done. What if we would take any other path but that one? Not that one. Nope, 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 nope. If all the paths seem easier, better, simpler, can we take one of those other paths? Why not? Let's look at a situation in which the path laid out was not how the one chosen to walk it wanted it to play out. In fact, they knew exactly what laid down the path before them. And they did not want things to happen like they would happen on that path. Let's turn to Mark 14. Mark 14, 32 through 36. Now we know this scene, right? This is garden in the Garden of Gethsemane. Starting at verse 32. Then they came to a place which is named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And they said to him, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther, and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass for him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. We all know the scene, right? Jesus, Garden of Gethsemane, just before he's tortured and killed. He was deeply distressed. This was the night where he fell on the ground and prayed. Luke, of course, the scene is him basically having sweat drop off his face, big drops of sweat. He was that distressed. He was troubled about what lay ahead. He knew the torture, the suffocating death, when nailed up there between common criminals, while crowds looked on. This is king of kings, lord of lords. And he's being sent to willingly submit to a humiliating death for people who may never understand or appreciate what he's doing for them. Jesus is praying, Dad, Father, is there any other way? I know 
there's other ways. Will you let there be another way? But then he says, if not, then your will be done and not mine. Even in these last moments, Jesus is modeling for us how we should be in times when it's scary, when it's distressful, when it's hard. It's not a path we would choose for ourselves, but it's what God laid in front of us. It takes strength, courage, and fortitude to be a Christian, doesn't it? Because there's times when that path is not going to be the one that we want, but it's the one that we've got. Now, we're looking at an extreme example here. This is Jesus on that before his death, and that's pretty extreme. And I hope none of us will ever be even close to that. I know we won't, but that's a one-time only event in history. What about some more common situations? What about situations we face in every day? Can we apply choosing God's will of our own in our daily lives? Now take this. What about when it's easy? What about things are comfortable? When we're in that comfort zone, things are good. How hard is it to leave that comfort zone? To step out, to talk to someone new, to take a risk, share God's love with someone we don't know. Even though it's scary and uncomfortable, that's what God is asking of us, isn't it? Now, not everyone has the gift of gab and can talk to people easily. I'm not one of those. But that's not exactly what God's asking right here, right? He's asking, use our gifts, whatever they are, writing, art, service, teaching, whatever it is. The many gifts that God provides, use them to serve him, show his love to others. That's what he's asking for us, right? With all the ways to serve God, with all the ways to spend time with God, learn to know him, learn to trust him, to grow to love him. Why do we still choose our path over his? And so I've been thinking about this. And if you bear with me, I've got another experiment. Dad, I won't jump towards you again. Well, let's try another one. Now, try this in your mind, okay? Imagine turn over the control of all your finances, your bank accounts, your cash, everything to a random. So pick a random person and then call this guy Festus. Now, has anybody ever seen the old gun smoke, old Western gun smoke? You might know this guy. Well, you don't, if you don't know him, just picture this guy. He's pictures enough. Now, imagine you're going to turn over to this fellow all your finances. Everything that you have, everything that you own, it's all up to him. Now, if you want to spend money, you got to ask him. If he wants to spend money, he does it. It's all up to him. Now, how many of you are comfortable with that situation? Yeah, I see a lot of heads shaking. No, no. If this was a serious conversation, there'd be some fighting words, wouldn't they? <laughs> we work too hard for that. There's no way we're going to let some random dude just take control, right? Now, let's raise the stakes. Let's take it a little bit higher. What if it was not just our finances, but our whole life? What if the proposal was let Festus control our lives? Where are we going to live? Who are we going to marry? What are we going to do with our life? All of it up to Festus. I still see some heads shaking even more. <laughs> now, and that is enough to make you shudder just thinking about it. Yeah, there's not much else will, right? Some random stranger taking over everything. Now, what's the issue with this situation? Why do we have such an injection to it? It's Festus, isn't it? Does he look like the savviest financial advisor you could hire? No, he doesn't, right? It doesn't look like he has much money on his thing. His hat's all scruffy. He's not shaved yet. The core of the issue is trust and control, isn't it? We don't trust him. We don't want to relinquish that control. We desire our own control of our own destinies. But it's an experiment, right? Let's take this a little bit further. Could those same issues of trust and control be the same issues with our reluctance to give God control and trust him with our lives? 
It's our lives, our loved ones, all that we have that we're entrusting to God. That's the stakes. That's what we're talking about. That's what's on the line. We are humans. We need to trust the being. We're placing everything in our lives, our all, into their hands, don't we? So let's start with trust, and then we'll come to control. How can we trust God if we don't know him? We can't, can we? How do we build trust in another human? Say what's fastest. We don't want to go there. Say it's another human. Anybody, any other human. How do you learn to trust them? It takes time, doesn't it? It takes repeated encounters, repeated instances, when that person comes through for us over and over before we learn to trust a person. Doesn't that same thing apply to God? Can we expect to have trust without experience with him? Not truthfully. No matter what we say, unless we spend enough time with God to get to know him, to see how things come through every time, really give him a chance to actually prove himself, we won't truly trust him, will we? We've got to give him that chance to show himself to us. And notice we're saying, learn to trust. Like other learning. It's not just knowing of God, but the actual experience. Getting into things with him. Getting through hard times and knowing what happens, what he does. When Jeannie and I were having kids, we knew each other. We got married. We had, knew each other to have a kid. But I got to tell you, after the nearly three days we stood awake when Alex was born, we knew each other a lot better. It's a whole other world when you're having a difficult time and you're with that person. And that's what it's like with God. Let's look back to Mark 14. Jesus knew God's power. He was God in human form. He knew the plan and has known it from the very beginning. However, he was fully human. No human wants to be tortured to death. No one signs up his mouth and says, yes, today I'm going to be scourged and stripped and killed. Woohoo! Nobody's going to do that, right? God showed us what it's like to be a human in that situation because that's what he was in. That's what he was facing. And he was showing us exactly what we've got to do when we're in something like that. God chose that path for how his plan would work as it was the one that would show us his extreme love for us. And that he was willing to take on everything that we do on his back, even in the lowly form of a human. Jesus had incredible strength and fortitude to go through what he did to show us God's love. If this is any other human, not Jesus, in this situation, how many of you would think, you know, God, I know you're telling me it's the only way, but what if I held up a sign, said, God loves you? That worked right. That lasted the ages. It's not the same, right? When we celebrate that communion every Sunday, there's power in that moment. There is force in the fact that He went through all that He did for us that had to play out exactly how it did to prove to us god could do anything but he did what he did for us and i'm so glad that was god in human form that was doing that and not me how did jesus know that path ahead was the really the only one that could work that would prove his love that would suffice to save us well, he's jesus Let's just say he has a very long history with God. But how do we get to that rock solid trust in God? We have to accept what he lays in front of us, even when we don't understand the things we're getting into. Same way, right? Learn to trust takes time, takes experience. It takes a long history of living close to God, seeing his love come through over and over. Take stepping out in faith. Those times when it's like, I don't know how it's going to work out. But okay, God, you tell me to do this. Let's do this. When we see we land up in a better place because of what staying close to God. And even though it may have been a hard path, it was the right path. Now we've talked about trust. Let's talk about control. What is it about letting go of control that's so very hard to do? Now, both Jeannie and I have a bit of a need to control in us. 
she puts up with me and I'm very thankful for that. When we were first married, whenever the other one was driving, the other one had a stick ready to cope with it, they'd fall asleep. It's basically, I'm not behind the driver's wheel, I'm gonna ignore that. And when you're unconscious, you can really ignore what's going on, right? That's how we dealt with things. But after years of marriage, being the driver or the rider with each other, we both stay awake now. We went across country and she was awake for most of it. And thank you for doing that. It took time. It took years of knowing each other, riding with each other to be able to say, hey, look, I don't have to freak out and pass out until this is done. But what about not being behind the wheel was so concerning? If it's not me behind that wheel, if something happens, I can't control it, right? I can't affect it. There's no brakes on the right-hand side of the vehicle. However, I can now counter that with, what does that matter? If we're in a wreck, my whole world's in that vehicle. Doesn't matter who's driving. Doesn't matter who's in the passenger seat. What matters is what happened, right? That's what's important. When something like planes, some of the World Trade Center on this day in 2001 happened, could we control those planes? Could we do anything about it from thousands of miles away? No, that's out of our hands. Where any concerning events happen to us in this realm of existence, they're going to, they're going to continue to. And there are times in our lives and circumstances will be out of our control. We have a choice to either go down the path thinking that we have to take on the world by ourselves, which is never going to end well, when we go down that path that leads to God, God is the only one who can make beauty out of tragedy. He's the only one who can guide us in situations which are too much for us. Letting God be in control of our lives goes back to trust. I've learned that he is always right. God's not Festus, is he? That's a big step up. God is the almighty Lord of all. And we need to learn that we are not. And that takes humility and strength. Trust God over ourselves, doesn't it? Letting go of control means that we finally admit and not, we are not God, that we need God. That is not easy. And that's why letting go of control is so hard. It's denial of self. We sing that song, more of you and less of me. That's what that's about. It's saying that I'm not you, God. I will trust you. And that's hard because that's something everybody in this world wants to latch on to and not let go of our own destiny. It's the one thing we've got. It's the one thing we're turning over to the Lord. That takes time and effort to learn that. So it's starting to come to the end of the message for today. If we realize that God is who can get us through situations, that are far beyond what we can take on by ourselves. Why do we not trust him with simple matters in our lives? We're making decisions, facing the challenges of the day, going through our lives. How often do we stop, pray, ask God for guidance, even in small things? Seek out what God wants us to do. It's easy to forget God in a lot of these things, right? Small things, even going out day to day, starting your day, going through your day, we need God for pretty much everything. And we should always be talking to him. If we realize that God is who can get us through situations that far beyond what we can take ourselves through, why don't we trust him with the things that are simpler matters in our lives? When we're making decisions, facing those challenges, going through our lives, that's when we gotta still remember God, even in the day to day. Now, is it part that we have a tendency to take the Lord for granted and part that we may be scared what he's going to ask us to do? I'd say it's both. I may want to take the easy path. It may seem right to me. It may be what I want. But does God want me to? Is that what God has planned for me? Is the easy path going to lead me back to God? Will it save my or someone else's soul? If we live a life with God, read his word, talk with him in prayer, 
we will know what God wants us to do. God is not shy. He'll tell you. We only have to listen, be willing to accept his response and guidance, even if it's not what we want to hear. We have the, a huge letter from God, tons of instruction in it called the Bible, and it's there for us to read. Now, not always getting what we want doesn't seem very fun, does it? Here's the catch. The more we live with God, the more we learn to see things from his point of view, the more we learn what is really important, the more what we want will line up with what he wants. And what does he want? God wants us to find our way back to him, to truly know him, to truly know what it means to be loved and to love. And when we get to that point, and that is what we also want, we can better understand what Jesus says the following. If you would turn me one last verse, Matthew 11, starting at verse 29. Matthew 11, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The things we'll go through in this life can be hard. They can be difficult. They can be painful to endure. But as long as we're in God's hands, we will make it through. We'll come up better as long as we stay with God and trust his plans and his guidance. The trials of this short life pale in comparison. We weigh them with eternity. When we understand that God's will leads us back to him and his love, accepting and dealing with those times becomes something we can handle. When we stay focused on God and keep our eyes on him and what he has planned for us, we make it through. Now, coins aren't very readily available, but everybody knows a coin, right? While they're still available, before they go out of circulation, get your coin, keep in your pocket. The next time you start to want to place your wheel in front of God's, take out that coin. Read the inscription on it. Remember that God is who we trust with all that comes our way in our life. When the legislators pass that law to place in God we trust on all of our currency, this was in 1955. It was after the end of the World War II. It was a time of civic struggle. It was a time of international struggle with the Cold War. It was a great idea to write those words on it to remind us. In God we trust. This morning, or any time, actually, when you learn enough about God and his love that you're ready to give your life to him, trust him in your life, commit your life to him. There's always water that can be found for baptism. We encourage you to make that choice. Trust your life to God. He gave us our lives. He gave us our souls. It's logically only right we give them back to him. If you would like to be baptized, you have any other need before they come for the congregation. Please stand to it, stand, come forward, or contact us online as we stand and sing. Thank you.